glorious devotees. Thank you so much for tuning in to another presentation on Sri Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's Sri Madhurya Kadambani, The Monsoon Clouds of Sweetness. In today's presentation, we will be speaking about the nature of bhakti and that bhakti is the fruit of bhakti. In other words, the practice and the attainment are of the same nature. This particular presentation will be the culmination of this initial cloud bank, the super excellence of devotion, and we'll bring home the overall presentation's theme, D is fully independent and self-manifesting. Sri Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur continues in his Madhurya Kadamani. Bhakti is the cause of bhakti. Teaches us that the fruit of bhakti in practice is bhakti in love for Krishna, showing that bhakti itself is the crest jewel of all human goals. We have thus described to some extent how bhakti this great manifestation of Krishna's essential potency is all-pervading, all-enchanting, all-enlivening, super-excellent, most independent, and self-manifesting, just like the Lord. If one takes to another path other than bhakti, then what can be said other than he is lacking in vision? Bhaktya Sanjataya Bhaktya. Bhakti is the cause of bhakti. To establish that the practice and the goal of bhakti are the same, Vishwanath again quotes Sri Prabhuda from the Srimad Bhagavatam's 11th canto. Smaranta smarayantascha mithyo gaugra haram harim bhaktya sanjataya bhaktya bibrat yut pulakam tanum. The devotees associate with one another by remembering Krishna together and reminding each other of him. In this way, they help to purify each other of sin. Practicing devotion, sadhana bhakti, in this way they attain devotion in divine love, prem bhakti, which fills their bodies with ecstatic reactions like hairs standing on end in ecstasy. This verse exemplifies that the cause of that mercy that is bhakti is the bhakti that is residing in the heart of of a great soul. Since his mercy cannot appear without bhakti, the conclusion is that bhakti is the cause of bhakti. We note in the other paths, in karma, jnana, and yoga, the means or sadhana and the end or sadhya are different. Let us first take a look at karma. The goal of the path of karma is attainment of earthly pleasure and heavenly bliss. The karma marg is adherence to the regulations of Varnashram Dharma, an engagement in sacrificial performances. The goal of yoga is the attainment of mystic opulences and paramatma sayuja. The yogis take up the eightfold practice of yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, and so on.
The goal of Gyan is Brahma Sayuja, or merging into the non-personal Brahman. The Gyani conducts a life of complete self-control, Shastric contemplation, and meditation. It should be noted that in all three of these paths, as the practitioners advance, be they a yogi, a jnani, or a karmi, by their advancement, they reduce their practices and become absorbed in relishing the fruits of their respective paths. As spoken by Sri Narottam Das Thakur in his Prem Bhakti Chandrika, the characteristic of pure devotion is that in its immature stage, it is known as sadhana bhakti, while in its mature state, it is known as prema bhakti. Each stage of bhakti's development is the cause of the subsequent stage. This is sometimes likened to the ripening of a mango. Advancing devotional practice and its associated realizations and bestowal of spiritual fulfillment, accompanied by blissful experience, has been compared to the ripening of a mango. The unripe mango is sour, while a ripe one is very sweet and tasty. Vishwanath proclaims that bhakti is the crest jewel of all the goals of human life, Purusharthas. So much so that even the liberated are attracted by bhakti to the Lord. Sankaracharya himself has spoken the following in his commentary to the Nishringa Tapani Upanishad. Even those who are liberated desire to accept a spiritual body and worship the Lord. Also, the great Sukadev Goswami spoke the following to Maharaj Parikshit. O saintly king, I was certainly situated perfectly in transcendence, yet I was still attracted by the delineation of the pastimes of the Lord who is described by enlightened verses. The glories of bhakti are so wonderful and unparalleled that every living entity should desire to attain it and nothing else. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke the following to Srila Rupa Goswami. The ocean of the transcendental mellows of devotional service is so big that no one can estimate its length and breadth. However, just to help you taste it, I am describing but one drop. This brings us to the conclusion of the first shower of nectar, which has given us some glimpse into the super excellence of bhakti. And we have unpacked comprehensively this first shower with sufficient support through the primary literatures used as evidence, praman, of the Gaudiya Vaishnav Sampradaya. Before we move on to the second shower of nectar, the birth of the bhakti creeper, let us do a very quick review of what has been presented up to this point. We began this first shower of nectar by being given an understanding of the book's title, Madhurya Kadamani, as referring to a very specific, unique sweetness of the Supreme Lord that is only made available to his topmost devotees that worship him in unalloyed love in Vraj, his 
topmost spiritual planet, Galoka. Presentation continue with an explanation of the Mangala Charanas, the two opening verses, the first one complementing the causeless and completely independent mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and how his mercy so exquisitely nourishes the ninefold process of bhakti in the devotee's heart. The Mangala Charana continued by its praise of Srila Rupa Goswami as follows. In previous ages, many great souls took shelter of Bhakti Devi. However, by the grace of Krishna's dear associate, Srila Rupa Goswami, we have been given the wisdom to realize her in the form of rasa. I therefore pay my obeisances to him constantly. Next, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur praises the perception of Krishna that comes into the consciousness of the practicing devotee as he engages in unalloyed devotion. This blissful Lord descends to human perception of the ear, eye, mind, and intellect, not by any material cause, but simply by his own independent will, just as, by his own will, he appeared in the material world as Rama in the Ragu dynasty and Krishna in the Yadu dynasty. Vishwanath proceeded to extol the virtues of bhakti as being completely independent, the supreme dharma of all human beings, sadhana bhakti, is that by which Prem bhakti to the Lord arises. This bhakti is not caused by anything other than itself, cannot be obstructed, and it satisfies the mind completely. Bhakti also proceeds by its own independent will, yadrichaya, if by unexpected association with devotees, one develops faith in my glories, that person, being neither very disgusted with nor very much attached to material life, is qualified for bhakti and will achieve perfection. So bhakti here is completely independent, coming through the agency of Krishna's pure devotees. There's nothing that we can do in order to attain this glorious gift of bhakti. Bhakti is bestowed by Krishna's devotees as Vishwanath continues to explain. Devotees bestow Krishna's Kripa Shakti. We can look to Srila Jiva Goswami's Bhakti Sandarbha. Thus it is established that Bhagavan's mercy, which is present in his devotees, descends upon another living being either through the medium of saintly association or by the blessings of a devotee, but not independently. He gives his Swarup Shakti in the form of Bhakti to his devotees. He can only reciprocate with his Swarup Shakti. Thus he reciprocates only with his devotees. Vishwanath continues to explain that no amount of piety can contribute to one's attainment of bhakti. Much evidence is given in this regard, but one such evidence comes from Krishna's instructions to Uddhava. Although one engages with great effort in mystic yoga, the path of philosophical analysis, charity vows, chanting sacrifices, explaining the Shastra, studying the Vedas, or renunciation, still one cannot achieve bhakti. The discussion continued to explain the complete independence of bhakti and that bhakti nourishes other spiritual paths, that of yoga, jnana, and karma. 
It was also pointed out the pitfalls of the paths of Karm and Gyan. Here, as one of the evidences, Praman, of the story of Wasta's mince pronunciation of the words Indra Shatro in a sacrificial performance are given as an example of how even the most carefully laid plans within the paths of karma and gyan can be laid to ruin by some small discrepancy. The discussion continued and showed that material desires are themselves not obstacles on the path of bhakti. Quoting from the Bhagavad Gita's famous verse, Apichet su Racharo. Even if a man of abominable character engages in Ananya Bhajan, exclusive devotion to me, he is still to be considered a sadhu because his intelligence is firmly fixed in bhakti to me. Vishwanath made it clear that the path of Gyan alone does not lead to bhakti in and of itself. However, bhakti, out of her kindness, sometimes serves those that are engaged in the path of Gyan by mercifully accepting Sattva Goon to help such Gyanis attain their goals of Nirvasesh Brahman. And ending up this first cloud bank of nectar, we come to this conclusion that Bhaktya Sanjataya Bhaktya, that Bhakti is the fruit of Bhakti. I want to thank you so much for viewing this presentation and hope that you have seen this entire series on the first cloud bank of nectar coming from Vishwanath Chakravarti's Sri Madhurya Kadamani and that you will come back as we continue to proceed in small installments to fully unpack this wonderful work by Vishwanath that is a handbook for our devotional practice. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.